So what we're going to consider now is the main free path. So the main free path of a molecule is actually the average distance it transverses between collisions. So we've kind of been ignoring this a bit in the past, but it makes sense that as the density of a gas increases, the number of collisions of each molecule with other molecules is actually going to increase, and this is going to affect the motion a bit. So lambda represents the average distance that a molecule moves before it collides with another molecule. And this is given by 1 over the square root of 2 times pi d squared, where d here stands for the diameter of the molecules. n, this is the number of molecules that we have, and v, this is the volume of our gas. So let's have a look now at why this makes sense. We won't derive it exactly, but we will show why it has this type of relationship. Okay, so what we're going to be considering is molecules colliding. So to collide, we've got two molecules like this. They've both got diameter d, and they have to come such that their centers are within a distance d of each other. If that happens, then a collision has occurred. Now that's quite clear. We can actually model this a bit more easily, however, if we consider just our one moving molecule as having a diameter 2d and then we can consider the other molecules as stationary points. So this is um, a point and it's the other molecules. So we won't prove now that these are equivalent. If you like a bit of a challenge then you can try showing this at home. So this is what actually happens. This is our equivalent model that will be using to simplify it. So let's consider a time interval delta t. So in a time interval delta t, our molecule travels a distance v delta t. And so we can imagine this is our molecule. It traces out a kind of cylinder like this. So this has got a radius d and it travels some distance v delta t. And however many of these points are inside this cylinder, those are the points or the molecules that it collides with. So in this time interval delta t, the volume of that cylinder is given by pi d squared. So this has got radius r, so the area of a circle is pi r squared, which is pi d squared in this case, times the length, which is v delta t. And so the number of points it collides with is just given by the density of the points. So the density of these points is given by the number of molecules divided by the volume. So this is given by n on v times pi d squared v delta t. And so that is how many it collides with in time delta t. And now and now lambda is just equal to the length of the path during delta t, so this length here, divided by the number of collisions. Because remember lambda is the average distance it travels between collisions. So the length of the path it travels is given by v delta t, we've shown that there, and the number of collisions is given by this here, n on v pi d squared times the velocity delta t. This v is the volume, this v is the velocity. So now we can make a number of simplifications, that delta t cancels that, that's the velocity there, this is the velocity here, so they cancel out. And so this is equal to 1 over n on v pi d squared. Now we made a big simplification here. We just assumed that these points were stationary, which they're not. So 
if you want a challenge, you can show that the relative velocity is equal to the square root of 2 times the average velocity. And this is where that root 2 comes from. So we actually end up with lambda equals 1 over root 2 pi d squared n on v where d is the diameter of the molecules, n is the number of molecules in the volume v of the gas. And this is the average distance it travels between collisions. Now another thing that it's worth looking at is that we've been looking at the average speed of the particles of the gas. But it should be remembered that this is just the average speed. There's a whole range of speeds which the particles in the gas can be travelling at. So Maxwell actually came up with an equation for this. This is the molar speed distribution equation and it shows the probability of a particle having a particular speed v. If we plot it, we end up getting a curve like this. So you can see there is a minimum to speed that they can have, but then there's not really a maximum speed. So there's a long tail here. So you can see on this graph, we've got the root mean squared velocity is indicated by this line here. The average velocity is a little bit less. It's indicated by this line here. And then the most probable velocity is a little bit less than that even and is marked by this speed here. And as the temperature increases, so 300 kelvins is bigger than 80 kelvins, the peak of this distribution moves to higher speeds. So to work out the average speed, we just need to integrate between 0 and infinity of the speed, which is v, times this probability of it having a particular speed. So that's really a whole lot of maths. There's standard integrals that we can use to get this value out, and that ends up being the square root of 8rt divided by pi m. Now the root mean squared velocity is the square root of the average velocity squared and so we can say that well the average velocity squared that's just v squared times the probability of it having a particular v so again using standard integrals to solve that between 0 and infinity we end up with 3 rt on m and so the root mean squared velocity is the square root of this thing here and finally the most probable speed well that occurs when dp dv is equal to 0 and so again, using maths, we can solve that to show that the most probable speed is equal to the square root of 2RT on M. So if you love maths, then have a go at solving these for yourselves. Otherwise, you can just take my word that if you use the standard integrals, this is what you get.